Welcome everyone. This is the training video for Disability 101, the Ability Inclusive Mindset Training. My name is Katie Fatella. I am the Chief Program Officer at the Nora Project. I use pronouns she, her, and I am a white woman with brown hair pulled back into a braid. I'm wearing a headset, a pair of red framed glasses, and a black shirt, and I'm sitting in front of a pastel virtual background. Hi everyone. I'm Trace Holly. I am the UK a program called Native for the Nora Project. My pronouns are he, her, hers, and I'm wearing a turquoise jumper with um short red hair, and I'm sitting in front of a blurred green background. On this side, there's an image of students with the arms around one another, and the text we want a missions promote disability inclusion by empowering educators and engaging students and communities with an orange box that says learn more. The NOAA Project is a non-profit organisation and we provide school high staff training as well as curriculum for classrooms Sorry, one sec. as well as curriculum for classrooms in preschool called Free Secondary School, that focuses on disability studies, friendship and empathy skills and advocacy. You can learn more about our programmes and find lots of resources for teachers and parents on our website, www.thenoraproject.nga. There are three main objectives for this presentation. The first is to learn some foundational information about disability, which will improve your comfort with disability studies content as you prepare to teach this unit. Next, you'll reflect on the Nora Project's Ability Inclusive Mindset Framework. And finally, you'll apply your learning to some common scenarios to envision a more inclusive school environment. On this slide, there are two icons representing wheelchair users. The one on the left is the traditional accessibility symbol, and the one on the right is known as the accessible icon. The traditional symbol communicates a sense of dependence and confinement, playing into the societal stigma around disability as something tragic or unfortunate. But the image on the right turns that upside down and communicates a sense of agency, activity, and independence. We want to ensure that the imagery we use and the language we use when discussing disability promotes that more progressive view of disability as an identity and a natural part of human diversity. The imagery on this slide gives us a nice starting point as we dive into our disability studies content. Today, we'll share information that challenges societal views on disability, so having the accessible icon in your mind will be a nice foundation for what you learn. Let's relate the history of the stigma that typically surrounds the term disability. Many people hesitate to use this word because of the stigma, thinking that the word disability or disabled are negative or insulting. In fact, disability and disabled are preferred identity terms of us adults fighting for equality for people with disabilities today. Many of us claim disability as a part of our identity, which relates strongly to and in which we take great pride. Euphemism such as special needs or differently abled or handicapped, diminished disabled experience, and further stigmatise that which is different. If you Hope to think about it. There's nothing particularly special about how needing acts as to healthcare, education, safety, or public accommodations. When people identify as having a disability, we are granted the rights under and protections under the Equality Act 2010. Put simply, the Act is designed to prevent direct and indirect discrimination of people with disabilities, as well as harassment and victimization. Of course, the Act is limited 
hid in its hope and does not provide true equity. But ultimately, the goal is the law to ensure people with disabilities can reach their full potential and participate in in an equal society. This slide has three colored circles. They are teal uh, with white text in each one. So next let's dispel some myths and misunderstandings wrapped up in disability. First, even though disabled people are marginalized in a way that may force them onto the sidelines or out of sight, it's untrue that disability is unusual. Disability impacts one in five people in the UK. Worldwide, the figure is one in four. That's 25% of the population experiencing disability, and this number continues to grow. So disability is everywhere, whether you're aware of it or not, making it even more important to understand so that we can demonstrate respect and create a more inclusive world. Another myth is that disability is tragic or unfortunate, and that disabled people would prefer to be non-disabled. Disability is so much more complex than this. Disability he can certainly be challenging and disabled people may feel a range of things about their disability, from great pride to grief. Just like any other identity part, the way people feel about and claim their disability can change over time. And the way they appear person experiences disability can also change over time. Myself and other disabled activists will often tell you that we would ever want to separate ourselves from our disability because our disability makes us who we are or has afforded us unique opportunities. Regardless of how an individual feels about their disability, it's important to avoid using terms that paint disability in, in, an, in a negative light. Terms like suffers with or wheelchair bound perpetuate the negative stigma around disability. Disability is a neutral, is neutral so we, we want to use neutral language to describe it. Finally, we must understand that the disability community is not a monolith. This, of course, is true of all diverse communities. Identity exists on a spectrum. So what is true for one disabled person may not apply to the next, and a vast amount of diversity exists within disability. For instance, a person can be born with a disability or acquire it. Uh, disability can be apparent or non-apparent. A disability can be long-lasting or temporary. Another common difference centers around language preferences. Some folks prefer identity first language, such as I am disabled or I am autistic, while others prefer person first language, such as I have a disability. You'll notice we switch back and forth to honor both preferences. And every person has different accessibility needs and preferences. Sometimes these needs may conflict with another person's accessibility needs. So a good rule of thumb is to ask a person about their preferences and how they can be accommodated. On the left of this slide is an image of the disability pride flag. It has a black background with five multicolored stripes running diagonally across it. So as I shared, the disability community is not a monolith. There's an incredible amount of diversity within the community and Disability is intersectional with every other identity. Race, gender expression, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, all of those. Anyone can experience disability at any point in their life, be it temporary or long lasting. Most people will recognize the universal accessibility symbol, the blue background with an image of a wheelchair user as the key symbol of disability, but it leaves out the diversity of the disabled experience. The symbolism in this flag is rich. The disability pride flag was created by Anne McGill, who is herself a disabled woman. The flag has been a collaborative process to reach its current design with much feedback from others within the disability community in order to refine some of the visual elements. 
If you've engaged with the older flag in the past, which had a lightning bolt on it, it caused a strobe and flicker effect when viewed on electronic devices. This caused folks to experience seizures, migraines, and disorientation of all sorts. So the current design is meant to improve visibility. <coughs> On the new flag, which is similar, the black, black, the black field represents mourning of a and range the victims of ableist violence and violence and abuse. The diagonal band represents cutting across the walls and barriers that separate disabled from normal society. It's what hell is like create and create heavy cutting through the darkness. Each colour from left to right represents category of disability, which include mental mental illness, diversity, intellectual and developmental disability, non-apparent disability, physical disability and sensory disability. The parallel stripes represent solidarity with the community despite their differences. However, what we ultimately want you to understand is that disability is an individual experience. Often people hear diagnosis and believe it, believe that they can infer everything they need to know about a person. But particular diagnoses offer limited insight into a person's needs and capabilities. And definitely won't tell you much about the person. Disabled people are diverse and have different experiences, and and they also are a part of a rich community with a vibrant culture. On the right side of this slide is a thumbnail image of a video clip. It pictures a wheelchair user at the base of a set of stairs. There are many different models of disability, which are frameworks for understanding disability. The two most common models are the medical and social models of disability. We'll watch this quick video for an overview and comparison of those two models. According to the medical model of disability, the word disabled means less able. Less able to achieve your potential, less able to have meaningful relationships, less able to play an active part in the world around you, and that this is just your bad luck. This outdated view of the world puts the responsibility of overcoming disabling barriers on the person with an impairment. But this idea is changing. The more modern social model of disability says that a person doesn't have a disability, but that they are disabled. They are disabled by society. It is the attitudes and physical barriers imposed on them by society that prevents them from achieving their potential. The social model was developed by disabled people and their allies to help them take action against discrimination and to empower people to find solutions, remove barriers, and campaign together for equality and human rights. They showed how people with lots of different impairments face many of the same problems. These disabling barriers include prejudiced opinions and attitudes, restricted access, and people being systematically excluded. The social model looks for the ways that society can be planned and organised in order to provide accessibility, independence and opportunity in a way that enables people rather than disables them. What we learn from the social model of disability is that disability is a social construct created by social barriers, barriers which can be eliminated. 
we learn that it is the responsibility of government, public spaces, businesses and individual people to make the changes, to increase the access and build a more equal society where everyone has the opportunity to reach their full potential. In her book, Demystify Disability, Disability Act, Miss Emily Liss how writes about these two models and she explains that the reality is neither of the models can exist independently. As she puts it, sometimes I'll try to reach something I dropped on the floor and complain loudly while I struggle to pick it up. In those instances, his my perception of my disability is based on my impairment and my physical experiences. When I encounter a restaurant that people who can only enter by using steps, my physical limitations patients or sensations are, aren't the issue. Instead, it's the attitudes and obstacles beyond my control that are disabling. With this anecdote in mind, the third model to take into consideration is the biopsychosocial model of disability which acknowledge is that impairments can impact a person's quality of life and the medical interventions may be necessary, but also allows for an individual to identify strongly with a disability and recognises that societal barriers are disabling. On this slide, there's an icon of a person's head. At the top of the skull is a circular dotted outline with a pencil icon inside representing reflection. What have you learned so far? What are you still wondering? We would like you to pause the video and take a moment to reflect on your reflection sheet before moving on to the next part. This slide is full of text, which I will share aloud. Talila Lewis defines ableism as a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-Blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This systemic oppression leads to people and society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth or living place, health and wellness, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Talila is an abolitionist community lawyer, educator, and organizer whose work reveals and addresses the inextricable links between ableism, racism, classism, and all forms of systemic oppression and structural inequity. There are some very overt forms of ableism, like using the R word or intentionally excluding people with disabilities by not making a public space accessible, but often ableism is perpetuated in covert, unintentional ways. For example, ableism is present when a non-disabled actor is cast to play a disabled character in a play, movie, TV show, or commercial. It's also present when we are skeptical about whether a person is actually disabled when they ask for an accommodation or when someone parks in an accessible parking space but doesn't appear physically disabled. Microaggressions are concrete examples of ableism that are perpetuated often without intention. These are everyday heights and sort of discriminations against disabled people that many people don't even realize they're doing. However, the problem with microaggressions is that while usually unintentional, they have underlying messages that, are, that and they're actually really harmful. Being aware of microaggressions allows us to recognize when we heal them ourselves, but it also 
he draws attention to when others do it. This gives this opportunity to start a conversation or provide a gentle correction that may educate someone. For example, if you hear someone say, you must be an angel to work with those students, you might reply, there's nothing special about me teaching students who have the right to high expectations and accessing challenging instruction. Disability is a neutral part of human diversity. Simple thought provoking and stigma reversing. There are many different types of microaggressions related to ableism. As you can see in the table, uh, uh, there are many different types of microaggressions related to ableism, as you can see in the table. You'll find copy of the table on your reflection sheet. Pause the video now, view the table and reflect. On the top right of this slide is a photo of a smiling couple. A common microaggression is that when a person discloses a disability or a caregiver responsibility, we presume incompetence rather than treating them like capable adults and being creative about providing accommodations to maximize capacity. There's a principle called learned dangerous assumption, which is based on three key ideas. Number one, everyone has different abilities and talents. We should always assume that a person has unique strengths and contributions to offer. A person's identity is made up of different parts. You can't judge a person based on just one part of who they are. Instead, you have to think about the whole person. Number three, we all learn better when we participate in our own whole setting. What, when, what we're working on feels important to us. We can work hard to accomplish it. So we should never decide for another person what's best for them without consulting them first. The couple on the top right Hi, photo, a squirming hubs, disability advocates and huge heap stars. Shane is disabled and his wife Hannah is non-disabled. Hannah is often mistaken for Shane's nurse or caregiver. And Shane is often treated like a child or ignored altogether. When we make the these assumptions based on a person's appearance, we risk doing harm. We know this is potentially new knowledge, so now we'll shift our focus to shifting mindsets. Carol Dweck's research on mindset has become ubiquitous, influencing individuals, businesses, communities, and schools. But she offers us simple advice that at the Nora Project, we've known to be true because we've lived it. She says in her book, you have a choice. Mindsets are just beliefs. They're powerful beliefs, but they are something in your mind and you can change your mind. We've all come up in a society that favors the medical model of disability and marginalizes disabled people. That has a huge influence on our mindset. But knowledge is powerful and it will help us shift our mindsets to be more ability inclusive. Together, we're going to explore how using what we just learned about disability plus shaping our mindset to be ability inclusive can improve conditions for people with and without disabilities. Now we'll shift into the second objective and introduce you to framework we call the ability inclusive mindset, which is a collection of beliefs and behaviors that help guide our decision making and the way we move through the world. This mindset is what we 
cultivating our students over the course of a full school year in each of our programmes. It's something that is built steadily over time as students engage with one another, learn about disability indifference and practice empathy. As adults, we use the ability inclusive mindset to begin to transform communities and relationships. By modelling ability inclusive behaviour and approaching everything we do with an ability inclusive mindset, we can make our space is an environment more accessible, more welcoming, and more diverse. Shifting our mindset begins with shifting our belief structure. At the heart of an ability inclusive mindset are three core beliefs. The first belief is that accessible spaces are better spaces. A great way to understand this belief is to consider that when we adapt for disability, everyone benefits because everyone feels more comfortable in a space where they can interact in a way that meets their needs. The next ability inclusive belief is that inclusive activities are richer activities. Diversity can bring experience, perspective, and stability to a community, but that also means that community members have a wider variety of needs and expectations. While inclusive activities aren't always easier, they do ensure that participants will have access to diverse perspectives and therefore more opportunities for learning and growth. Finally, someone with an ability-inclusive mindset believes that all lives have equal value. This shift means challenging the negative societal narrative about disability and recognizing the value and power in each individual. When we encounter someone who seems different than we are, our interactions can present challenges. However, the belief that everyone has something meaningful to contribute allows us to persevere through challenging or uncomfortable interactions and give people the benefit of the doubt. In moments of conflict, this belief helps us to choose a kind response and to honor the dignity and value of others. And along with those three beliefs, we have three behaviors. Uh, first, creativity. In order to be inclusive and design accessible and inclusive spaces and events, we need to be he, we need to plan ahead and be intentional about the design of those spaces and activities. Ask he ask about people's accessibility needs and look for ways to accommodate them using tools or adapting activities when needed. Risk taking is is a critical skill for includers. It's not. It's a natural human impulse to surround yourself with people with whom you feel you have a lot in common. In order to welcome diverse and inclusive experiences and perspectives, as perspectives, we have to be willing to step outside of our comfort zones, meet new people, try new things, and get to know other people's stories. It's important to think broadly about this behaviour, considering the things that might consciously draw us away from working with certain people. Above all, we need empathy to be inclusive. This means taking time to get to know and, un- and understand people, to tune into their feelings and look for ways to support them when they are in need. This slide pictures multicolored lines which connect all the beliefs and behaviors of the ability inclusive mindset, showing that they are all interconnected. Together, these inclusive beliefs and behaviors make up the ability inclusive mindset. As you develop your ability inclusive mindset, you'll apply different beliefs and behaviors in all kinds of different combinations. Ultimately, though, an aim will help you see the world differently. You'll be better able to identify injustices and take steps to correct them, especially when it comes to the marginalization of the disability community. We've given you a lot to think about today. And the goal moving forward is to think about how you, how aim 
highest to you and the work in your school. On on the reflection sheet, you'll find two common school based scenarios to which you can apply your learning. Apply aimed to one or both scenarios and reflect on how an ability increase his mindset would impact the way you approach or think about that scenario. We look forward to receiving your reflections and providing feedback.